My next guest was a new immigrant to this country looking to fit in when he got caught up into a world of danger and drugs, but eventually led him to a place he never expected to be. Thanks for joining us, Boz. You are so welcome. Good to be here. So you came to BC yes. around 12 years old. That's right. And what did, you, what did you think of this new world that you entered into? Right. It's pretty amazing, to be honest with you. I came from Hong Kong. It was a culture shock for me. Uh, it's quite different from what I was born with and used to. So I need some time to adjust to this new space and, and, and a new place where I... It's quite different than my birth place. Now, like anybody who oh. comes to a new place, you want to fit in, you want to make new friends. Mm. So you tried to do that and ended up in a really dark world. Tell me about it. Right. Um, I remember the first few years of you know, entering into high school, um, it's just hard to fit in like what you said, especially the, the language barrier. I couldn't speak English this well before. Like, I was still trying to figure out what everybody is trying to say. So I was becoming like a, a loner, like a mute in, 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 in school. I met some people that also came from Hong Kong that also speak my, my home language, Cantonese, and I, feel, I felt a, a instant connection with them. Um, so, yeah, I started to hang out with those people and some of them were actually belong to some local Chinese gang and therefore I started to get to introduced to a brand new world that I was not used to mm. before. So that led a, into a life of drugs, sure. alcohol, tell Party. me yeah. partying, tell me about this lifestyle. Right, um, I used to be a, a straight A student. I, I used to be very good at math as <laughs> the stereotype of many Asians should be. Uh, my mom always wanted me to become either a, an accountant or you know, some of the stereotyping professional titles. A safe that, not, profession. Exactly. <laughs> but, um, but even though I was very good at math and, um, and, and all that kind of stuff, but I, I was very lonely inside. Now, these new friends brought me to a, a, a brand new world, so to speak, like partying, um, like what you said, like taking some drugs, weed, alcohol, cigarette, and after partying for, I don't know, year and a half, two years, I, I come down to a point where I felt like, yeah, I, I, I'm having this new sense of freedom, but then I, I'm losing everything else. I'm losing my relationship with my family. I'm losing my, my school mark at school. I'm losing even some of the, the good schoolmates that I used to hang out with that I didn't used to, that I didn't hang out anymore. So I, I, I did some soul searching at, 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 at that moment, and, and I remember this very, very um, incidents that I, 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 be, I, I remember I went down to this one particular party didn't talk anything that day didn't drink any alcohol didn't get any weed didn't do any drugs so I was standing in the middle of that dance floor so to speak I was looking up at the DJs and then I did a one, uh, 360 and I saw that all these people they were like zombies just looking up at the turntable and just moving crazy and then, and then I thought to myself oh my goodness so I had been one of them this whole time so that was kind of like a reckoning moment. Yeah. And I was like, wow, do I still want to continue to live like this anymore? Or is there a bigger purpose in life? So you're starting to explore your purpose, starting to think about the lifestyle that you're living, mm. and then you decide that you're going to go to Taiwan. You've been offered a music opportunity, mm. try to get away from the bad influence, but then you get a call from a friend. So yes, I um, started off this new adventure in life, this new purpose in life. I wanted to become a, a musician or performer, so to speak. So I started to, to develop my own rapping skills in Cantonese and, and Mandarin, and then starting to form my own hip hop group with some musical friends locally. And then we got picked up by uh, these record labels in, in Taiwan. So we were about to head off there. But, um, but back in the time, uh, we were I was living far, far away from the city, in a city called Coquitlam. And every time if I have to go to downtown Vancouver or Richmond to the recording studio, it took quite a bit of time. So my, my family, my parents, out of their love for, for supporting me, uh, we moved to a city closer to the airport, Richmond. So the house in Coquitlam was in vacant. And then yes, I got a call from some of this old friend from before that they wanted to use the house. Long story short, um, the, that incident became a kidnapping incident. 
and then the, the victim was actually stored inside the basement of my parents' home. And so eventually the police caught wind of it. They knew that the victim was in your parents' basement and you were arrested. Yes. It's more like they got arrested and then of course the house was our parents. So the police called my parents. I went down to, the old, to, the, to, the, to my old house with my parents and then the police was there and then, and then they came and handcuffed me right in the front of my front lawn. You were eventually found guilty. Yes. And sentenced to how much time? I was sentenced to 12 years. Wow. So what's going through your mind, Boz, as you're, you're now, you're a young man being sentenced to 12 years in prison in Canada? I remember when the judge, like, you know, pound uh, my sentence for 12 years, I, I, I at the, the first second I thought that I must be hearing this wrong. But then when reality kicked in, when I was dumb into a cell, when that reality kicked in, I was paralyzed. Mm. Just didn't know what to do once again. Yeah. What was prison like for you? The prison mentality is always surrounded with women and sex and drugs and gang pride and how can we make a name, street credit, all that kind of stuff as you can imagine as, as we all see in, in the movies. And I wasn't used to that. I was a musician, like I got some gangster friends, yeah, I mean, sure, but it was all for party. It wasn't for me to sell drugs or, or, or that kind of stuff. So I, I, I wasn't so, so used to that. Um, and I didn't have a lot of street credit to talk about. Like, you know, what street credit can I talk about? Like, I rap a little bit here and there, dealing with different companies and whatnot. So I, I felt very lonely once again. So eventually, there's an interaction with Jesus. <laughs> yes. And, and, yes. Yeah, unexpectedly. Tell mm -hmm. me how this happens in prison. Yeah, I've been in prison for about a year. Lost my girlfriend at the time. Left me on my first birthday in prison. Like, my, my life was pretty dark. Great depression. Didn't even want to go to get food from the kitchen anymore. So I just stuck, I, I, I just stuck in my cell the, the whole time. And lo and behold, there are some brothers and chaplain from the prison chapel came and knocked on my cell door, tried to reach out to me, brought me back to the chapel, tried to bring me up again. So I started to read the Bible more, started to go to services, tried to attend Bible studies, so I get a better understanding of Christianity. But then there's this one day, I remember it so clearly, I was in my cell, there's this one day, I was in my cell, and I was reading this scripture, I believe it's, it's a large portion of, of Matthew. Jesus said, I'm always with you to the end of the age. And then at that moment, I was just being, being really authentic and I, and I was just like, hey, God, you just, I cannot feel you, I cannot sense you, I cannot see you, I cannot touch you, I cannot hear you. You say that you're with me to the end of the age? Like, how is that possible? But then um, right after that, I, 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 I burst into tears and I said to him, but if you are real, come talk to me because I have nobody else. And a few weeks later, right before lockup time, we were praying. And I was really frustrated that day. And then in my heart, I, I, I said to God, I was like, you know what? I surrendered. Because I, I lost my appeal again. And I just lost all the opportunities that I could get my freedom back, so to speak. So I, I, I said to him, like, you know what? I surrendered. And then not too long afterward, I saw this vision of a gray white light coming down from heaven stopped right in front of me and then enter into my heart wow. and then my whole body just kind of like a little bit electrified a little bit tingling just a little bit not 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 so much it's a little bit and then a piece came from the core of my heart just extended to the rest of my body from head to toe wow. and i felt someone was like wrapping his arms around my my, my body and then i heard this voice um, don't be afraid, I am your Lord, and I will rescue you. And at that moment, I just believe it. I don't know why, but that, 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 that voice it seems like something that is, someone that is so close to me. Never heard it before, but I felt like someone so close to me, so I just believed it at the moment. And later on, um, I slowly come back to reality, so to speak. Your um, sentence was uh, taken down to four years? You end up serving four? Yes. Four years in prison. Yes. Um, 
and so you were able to to get out. Mm. <clears throat> Tell me about that. Having your sentence shortened, do you feel like that was an answer? My sentence didn't get shortened, but I was granted an early day parole. Mm. So that means I have still to serve my sentence while I'm living in the outside world with strict conditions and and monitoring, so to speak. I I think it was kind of like what you said. It was kind of like an answer to my prayer. Um, Ever since that experience with Jesus, I started to learn more about Him. I started to study courses at Bible College. And then I started to become a inmate peer counselor. So I started to help out a lot of inmates within prison with the chapel crew and the chaplaincy uh, in prison. So I started to learn how to serve God in, in, in so many different ways. So probably because of my my contribution to, 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 to the prison, uh, I got reason to be granted early day parole. Yeah. You have now started ministering, going back to prisons and ministering there. You've also become a pastor. Yeah. You've made some great connections with uh, people like Brian Dirksen, mm. who have partnered with you and help you. Mm. You have, you've changed your life. You found that purpose that you were searching for. Exactly. And now you're, you haven't forgotten where you were and you continue to serve in that community. Mm. Explain why, why do that? I believe it is a calling from God that maybe through my story, I can inspire somebody. Maybe through my transformation, I can be a living proof to the inmate that making a mistake is not the end. Um, Jesus has a greater hope and, and a purpose for all of us. If we can stick to Him, stay with Him, we can stay on the good path. Oh, that's so good. You've written a new book about yes. your journey, your story. Mm. Tell us what the name of the book is, when it will be released. Mm. So the book, I named it Beyond My Wildest Imagination. Because everything that I've been experiencing so far is beyond my wildest imagination. Every single part of my journey, especially right after I met Jesus. And this book is scheduled to be released early 2020. That's great. Thank you so much, Boz, for joining us you today. You are so welcome. So absolutely inspiring. And I love 